Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Cleveland C-Sharp User Group. A little bit about the group. We meet every month, typically every fourth week. The meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we cover a variety of topics related to .NET. You can find all the meeting information posted at meetup.com at the link listed at the bottom of the slide. If you're new to the group, please keep in mind this is very informal. We are open to a variety of different expertise levels, whether you're a student, a hobbyist, or a working professional, everyone is welcome. Uh, please don't treat it like a who's who's uh, symposium on C-sharp. We're all here to learn and bounce ideas off of each other. So feel free to jump in with any questions. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the .NET Foundation for sponsoring the Meetup website and NIS Technologies for sponsoring the virtual meeting space. In addition, we'd like to thank manning.com if you're interested, there's a variety of books that are offered at a 35% uh, off discount code, and the link as well as the discount code will be made available in the chat window shortly after the presentation. Some general information. Uh, please keep in mind, participation is always encouraged, and the one thing I always advocate is the only stupid question asked. So always feel free to jump in with a question or a comment. However, when not speaking, I kindly ask you to mute your microphone just to avoid any background noise. And we want to keep it casual, but or informal meeting, but at the same time, we want to give our speaker enough time to go through the, the slides and the demos. And lastly, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube in just a few short days. And the link to the YouTube channel will also be made available in the chat window shortly afterwards. So for tonight's feature presentation, we have Jonathan Danilko talking about improving website SEO or search engine optimization. He has over 30 years of experience. He joins us from the Columbus area where he focuses on ASP.NET development and web technologies. In addition, he's been the author of ASP.NET 8 Best Practices. And he is the founder of Tuxboard, which is an open source dashboard library for ASP.NET Core. You can check out a lot of his articles posted at danilcoweb.com. And so with that, Jonathan, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for that awesome intro. Holy smokes. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having me here, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, uh, as Sam said, I'm Jonathan Danilco, and tonight, or this afternoon, or sometime, I want to talk about SEO and what it can do for your website. Uh, and how to optimize it for search engines. Um, I'm currently an architect at Insight. Uh, I've been building websites since about 1995. And this, this I've been using, well, since 1995, I first, start, I first started building websites using Notepad. Not Notepad++, Notepad. Um, but now it's mostly Visual Studio, Writer, and VS Code. So. Um, as Sam said, I'm, I just released a, a book last year called uh, uh, ASP.NET 8 Best Practices, and I am the creator of Tuxboard, which uh, is open source C Sharp library for building dashboards. Okay. Before we start, I want to say something. Say something. Um, I've never worked at a search engine company, nor do I currently work for a search engine company, but I have seen, I have been on the internet way before search engines. So this and so I've seen some things. Uh, this presentation is mostly um, observations, guidelines, tools, and experiences on how to give your site a little more visibility to the search engines. So it'll be mostly a developer's perspective on SEO. Um, and everybody's results will differ because every company's search engine, you know, algorithm is, is different. Bing is different from Google, but uh, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And it's almost like I see search engine algorithms like a Coca-Cola formula. Not many people know every detail of the formula, but there's small hints that some signals indicating small successes. So anywho, let's get started and dig into some SEO because I have a lot of info that I like to cover and try and fill in uh, every single slide with some kind of value or takeaway. So let's dive in. So <clears throat> what exactly is SEO? SEO standards 
or it stands for search engine optimization. Okay. It's about improving the visibility of a website uh, for search engines through content architecture and technical metrics. So in turn, the search engine can identify which sites provide the most relevant information and serve it up to the users through the search engines. So I'm sure you've probably heard of SEM, uh, PPC. So what is the difference between SEO, SEM, and PPC? Well, SEO is strictly for uh, driving uh, organic search engine results, to, uh, delivering those to the search engines. Um, SEM is uh, search engine marketing. And that's what drives organic and paid results. Okay. And then PPC is pay per click, and that drives only paid results. So uh, while I feel this is something to mention, of course, SEO is geared mostly towards public websites. Okay. So if you have a login page, you know, last time I checked, I don't think some of the search engines can log into those websites and those pages. This is strictly for public, so, um, but you can do whatever you want on the login in, on your web apps with no penalty in the search engines. So, so <clears throat> why is SEO important to your website? Um, one reason, of course, I mentioned was visibility. Uh, it increases visibility when the right techniques are used on the web page, and we'll cover some of these techniques in a, in a bit. Um, search engines usually want to satisfy a user's search intent. So they look for sites that drive authority and awareness and increase the awareness of, the, of your brand. Most search engines reward for quality content uh, through, their, through their results page. Okay. Uh, SEO also establishes trust with your readers. Okay, if it you can consistently keep providing value to them, uh, they'll reward you with uh, repeat visits, provided you keep feeding your readers and the search engines really great content. The search engines look for this great content, and it has to be unique. Um, everybody continues talking about a certain topic, and people want a different perspective on it. They want to look at it a different way. Okay. Uh, and finally, SEO gives users a better uh, experience, a better user experience, because your users are looking for something specific, and if you can solve their problem, they will be extremely grateful. Uh, okay, let's move on. This guy's creeping me out a bit. I thought this was a good picture to use, but I regret my decision. Moving on. Um, but there is a report that came out I think it was a recent report from search engine land or search engine journal .com, and some SEO professionals are struggling keeping up with the with the search engines. So when they conducted the survey and asked what were the biggest challenges going into 2025, 22% said algorithm changes. Some of them they didn't know when they were released. Sometimes you didn't know what what they were when they were when they were released, what was it going to affect? And this is going back to that Coca-Cola formula. You know, not many people know what they change, but they are going to change something that might even affect your website in the long run. 16.2% uh, had problems with link building. Every time, or, or backlinks, you could call them backlinks. These backlinks are kind of like a vote for your website. If somebody creates a link for you, back to your website, that's a vote saying, this is really good content. So the more votes you can get back to your content, the better off you are. And this is one of the challenges that some SEO professionals are having problems with. And then finally, technical SEO, 13.4% were saying that they were having problems with technical SEO, which we will get into in a minute here. So you're probably thinking, Jonathan, there can't be that much involved with SEO. You, you you build a website and boom, you're indexed, right? Well, not exactly. Okay. Each aspect of the website can contain its own SEO guidelines. So it's it's segmented into the following categories. 
So we have content, we have off-page SEO, we have on-page technical, which is functionality, site maps, speed of the site. We also have local. If somebody types in a local, uh, like Grove City uh, landscaping, this would pick it up automatically. Excuse me. E-commerce. You optimize a lot of the keywords for some of these product uh, pages and category pages. So you find maybe a part number or something along those lines. It comes up in the search engines. Uh, international, you can have multiple languages. Uh, optimize that website for languages. And voice, optimizing for, I'm not going to say it, but uh, Google Home or, you know, Amazon's or, or uh, Apple's. Uh, but for right now, we could talk about we could talk about all of these topics for uh, easily two hours. And I, I don't think you guys want to stay on that long. But um, for tonight, we're going to focus on content on page and uh, one of the one of the uh, as mentioned earlier, one of the most difficult tasks in the industry: technical SEO. Okay. So let's get started with the content SEO. We can break content SEO into three categories, uh, architecture, copywriting, and, and keyword strategy. So site architecture matters a lot, OK? What do we mean when we say site architecture? Your URLs have to be short, descriptive, and contain keywords in the URL. So uh, most, most uh, users remember URLs uh, when they're catchy, you know, they're, they're, it's an actual sentence. It's almost like the human language of sorts, not numerical or cryptic like this one, 2837. Or, well, yeah, 2387. See, I even get it confused. Um, if your site is small, it's best to provide, um, okay, it, the 2387, notice how it's easier to, to just say how to skate. It's, it's a lot easier and people remember, remember it. So another thing you wanna do is provide shallow navigation, if it's possible. I know some of the large sites are hard to, it's hard to have a minimum click of like two or three clicks to somewhere, but it's best to have a shallow navigation, maybe one or two clicks to their destination and that's it. Uh, always, 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 always use HTTPS or SSL. Nowadays, when you visit a site and it's not secure, how does that make you feel? It, it doesn't support HTTPS. If it doesn't support it, it just doesn't feel too trustworthy. So search engines won't include your site in a search engine unless it's HTTPS. It, it's secure enough. So, and then <clears throat> canonicals. Um, canonical uh, URL is the version of a web page chosen as search engines, chosen by search engines as the main version of this of this content. So there's no duplicates. So for example, if you had a blog and you were on page two, the canonical would be mysite.com/blog, meaning this is the search, this is this is the paged uh, section of the arc, of the site. So. All right, so <clears throat> once search engines understand your site architecture and the structure of it, they'll reward you with visual enhancements and provide more exposure. So for example, if we decided to look for ASP.NET, notice at the bottom it says web apps, real-time ASP.NET with signal R, MVC pattern. These are sections in the uh, on the ASP.NET core website that Google decided to add in at the bottom, all right? So if they have, if search engines have even more information, you can actually get, uh, they'll create sections for you of almost like the, the top hits of what your website has. As you can see, I have knowing where to hit, start here about JD. A lot of, the, a lot of these websites have this type of, of uh, search engine results. So having a clear landscape of your site 
helps the search engines, and it helps your users in the long run. So provide as much information to the search, search engines as possible. And I'm stuck again. Okay, there we go. Um, the next topic, copywriting. You want to convey a good message through your website. And it's, it's, it's almost a science and an art. So one of the best ways to get traffic to your site is to create quality content people want to read. All right. Uh, whatever the site is or whatever you build, make sure it solves a problem. Because uh, we all know the Internet was created for three reasons, solving problems, selling something and watching cat videos or pictures. So that's um, back in the day, the, the quantity of a post was used to gauge a page's value. Everyone was creating 5000 word posts. But do you remember at the very bottom of some of the web pages, it would just be this long white space and it would be white font on white background and it would just be keyword stuffing it would just stuff all the keywords in there um, now nowadays you get dinged on that uh, so usually the page needs to be long enough uh, to solve the problem and be of high quality so as a general guideline a content uh, sweet spot is probably around 2,000 words but even more is absolutely encouraged think of let's see what was the one term that um, one of the guys came up with skyscraper content uh, skyscraper content is <clears throat> if somebody wrote a 500 word blog post you could look at it and say I can add more content to that and make it a little more valuable for a thousand words but also you'll have other people doing I can do it in 1500 and 2000 and there have, pe there have been people who created, I mean, almost books. Uh, Stephen Tobe and his .NET performance is one of those tomes. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen those that on, with uh, .NET's performance. Um, keeping your site updated is one of the ways to stay on a search engine's radar. Um, <clears throat> one technique I would recommend if you have old, old content is create an updated post and then put a link saying I updated it from this point from uh, this is the older post here's the latest and greatest because if you you can update it but I'm guessing uh, yeah you, you can update it update the content but it would make more sense to create a brand new post to refer back to it so internal linking is is important as we'll get to in a little bit um, <clears throat> when writing content for the web, uh, try to use as many relevant keywords as you can, okay? Uh, but don't overstuff. Like I said, keyword stuffing is bad. Uh, remember, uh, you, you want to use some of the tools out there for finding relevant keywords for your particular topic, okay? Uh, also, did you know that Google tries to help as much as possible to let you know what people are searching for. So if you typed in dashboards, since I've, I have my own little dashboard library, if you type in dashboards, at the very bottom, you have people asking, what is dashboards in Excel? Uh, people are typing in dashboards examples, dashboards UI, all of these, you could actually take these keywords, make a brand new post or make new content on your website and use them just to to get more uh more traffic but it has to be good quality content can't just be dashboards ui spewed through the whole article so okay keyword strategy since we're on keyword keyword topic uh keyword stuffing as i said before is not a good thing um, it's almost considered like a black hat strategy where uh, sites get penalized for it. If there's any, any indication of you trying to game the system, I, I guess I should explain the types and differences here. So the black hat SEO strategies are meant to game the system and get more traffic. Of course, it's definitely not advisable. Um, if Google or Bing or 
anybody catches wind of what you're doing, you could get the entire site banned. It may, you, you may get a page flagged, penalized, but the worst case scenario would be actually, you know, your site, entire site will be de-indexed. Um, the white hat is what we're talking about today, which is to be good medicines. And then gray hat techniques, um, which are acceptable, but they're questionable. Okay, what I mean by that is it's creating content that has no value, creating a blog post. It just it's just out there. Um, buying links. You buy links from somebody to send traffic to your website or paying for reviews. If you're paying for a review, that's it'll work, but I have a it's gonna get you in the long run. It's gonna penalize it may penalize your site. So I know I mentioned uh, how do you find keywords for your content? Okay. If you're first starting out with a site, uh, use G Google tools like uh, analytics, the search console or the keyword planner. Um, I have that backwards. Okay. If you're first starting out with a site, without a site, use Ahrefs or SEMrush or keyword planner. Keyword planner uh, is what I use for most everything for finding keywords out there. Um, what you wanna do is find five to 10 primary keywords for your particular topic, okay? Um, if you have an existing site, that would be this, analytics, search console, uh, and keyword planner. But you can also use Ahrefs SEMrush to analyze how people are finding you because they might have keywords that are they're entering into Google or Bing that get to your website, but then they bounce. There's a bounce rate. And that means the, the shorter duration that somebody's on your website, they didn't find what they're looking for. So the bounce rate could be two seconds. They go to your web page, see it, and then they bounce. They, they go somewhere else. They couldn't find, they couldn't answer their question. So, <clears throat> but once you find, once you find these relevant keywords, you, you want to write your content to include those keywords and, but keep them, keep the keyword to content ratio to about one to 2%. So keyword to content ratio, one to 2%. So even for every 200 words, that you have in a, in a blog post, include one of your keywords, whatever it is. So every 200 words, put a keyword in there. This will provide enough content to be indexed and appease the search engine gods. So uh, do we have any questions yet? I guess we could stop, we could pause for a second here. I have a question for you. Sure. So if, uh, let's say that a specific vendor services uh, multiple states and they want to list all the major cities in that state, <clears throat> pardon me, um, it's hard to write 200 words about each city in all those states. Uh, what do you suggest can be done at that point? It is that what some people have done, uh, it, you would still need some type of content but they do, I, I don't, I haven't touched on this in this presentation, but they would do something called programmatic SEO, where it would be uh, programmatic. It would, it, you would be able to put in the word like uh, landscaping in Grove City or landscaping in Columbus or landscaping in blah. It would all be server based that would deliver those results. But like you said, for 200 and some odd cities, that's a lot of content to make. I think you would have to come up with an angle on how to create it. Um, yeah, that would be a lot of work. Uh, well, let me let me think about that. <laughs> okay, sure, no problem. Let me think about that because if if you have a lot of you have a lot of cities, 
Yeah, you could say, you know, what services are offered in those cities. Um, yeah, I have to think about that because that would be good. You'd have to have a, a certain angle on uh, how to how to what kind of content to display for those cities. So again, that well, could be yeah. problematic. So. So one thing that comes to mind is uh, one of the utility companies uh, in our area, they service multiple states and uh, they just have the state names on the home page and you click on which state you're in and then it takes you to the login page. <clears throat> but assuming that, pardon me, assuming it's not a utility company, but rather a, a company that sells products and it's the same product or same across multiple states what can you say or what can you do to implement that in, in a search engine and i know you want so, some time to, to think about it and and uh yeah, respond yeah. well one of the things one of the things you can do is we'll be getting into a couple like next we'll be getting into the on-page seo the title and the description are pretty important so this would be two places to put that kind of information like landscaping and or landscaping in Ohio, uh, it would be mostly programmatic. So it would be server side as opposed to just plain HTML. It would serve up the, the name and the topic in the title. So the SEO, it would find that when it actually requested the page, landscaper dash in dash Ohio or something, um, or, you know, uh, services in these cities kind of thing so yeah um i have to think about that okay no problem but good question very good question thank you um any more questions before we proceed and that was that was just dealing with content so now we're going to dig into the on-page seo second um, the on-page SEO is the process of optimizing a web page content for search engines and users. So basically, how attractive or, or well put together is your website? Okay, is it is it something that people like visiting that they can find the information easy? Uh, this includes things like uh, properly formatted HTML document, uh, a title and meta description, as I just mentioned, uh, internal linking to relevant content on your site for further research and of course images so so let's break down each one briefly all right um, are you using semantic html semantic html is does your does your tags define the meaning of what's inside them okay so for example the header has header content. The footer has footer content. All of these different tags, uh, instead of a div across across the entire HTML document, these these little clues, these little hints that you put in your HTML helps out the search engines immensely. Okay, because you really don't like you really don't want to annoy web developers, but uh, anybody remember back in the day when browsers created more than one body tag in an HTML document? The structure of the document's important. So, for example, when something, when uh, let's say somebody created a table, I don't know how familiar everybody is with the HTML, but um, avoid placing paragraph tags between a you know a table row and a table cell. You know, it's just, you can't put it there. And if you have to, you could use the W3C validator for this. So just remember only one H1 tag in a page, in any page. Uh, okay, so some of the tags for these search engine result pages or SERPs, um, every page has to have a title tag. It has to be there. It's one of the most important tags on the page. So the tag, or the, the title tag, should describe the page in the, in the least amount of words with a primary keyword as close to the left as possible. Now, what I mean by that, I'll, I'll show an example here in a minute, but uh, the closer you can get those keywords to the left, starting it out, 
the, the better off you'll be in the search engines because some people will be looking for that particular keyword combination. Since there's only so much space to put on these result pages, uh, usually you want to keep it to about 50, 60 characters, between 50 and 60 characters. So <clears throat> the second most important tag is the meta, the uh, description. And that's usually about 150, 160 characters. Again, it's almost you know two, two uh, sentences that you can put on the, in the description. So there's one more called meta, meta name keywords. And this is almost back in the day, Google was looking at it, but now uh, they really don't care about it. As a matter of fact, they're getting rid of it. Uh, I don't, not getting rid of it, but they ignore it. That's what I meant. So as I mentioned before, once search engines understand the site on the, on the page, the, the site structure, they'll start showing your site with visual enhancements. So for example, let's say we do a search on life insurance quotes, okay? Notice the titles. The title tag, life insurance quotes. That's what somebody typed in. And notice progressives. They're about two words away, but they're still in the top, still in the top three, four, five, and even get a life insurance quote today but Liberty Mutual definitely takes the top spot because life insurance quotes is exactly what I typed in and that matched perfectly. The description, don't, don't skimp on the description either. Notice there's life insurance on Liberty Mutual and it's as close to the left, but quote is, is in there as well. Life insurance is, let's see, life insurance. Yeah, there's two sentences with life insurance for Liberty Mutual and also for Progressive. So you can see where it makes a lot of sense. If you can come up with being, being creative with your keywords of what people are looking for, you can definitely get a top spot. So you get more traffic, meaning more product sales or more services that you can apply. So, but so why why should we be concerned about internal links? Why are internal links important throughout your entire website? So let's say your site is dedicated to shoes. There should be links to pages mentioning, you know, sneakers, but it provides contextual linking for search engines. So for example, if you had a descriptive URL, I know where that's going. That is going to go to men's sneakers athletic shoes. On the page, we can also see, excuse me, inside the anchor, we see the text, men's athletic shoes. Uh, again, I'm showing my age. Does anybody remember back in the day where you have click me, click this, click here, click this, you know, it everywhere, <laughs> there was no context. Um, there was a, there was a book, uh, a uh, hot text by Lisa and Jonathan Price. And it was talking about, I mean, the book was about that thick and it talked about how to create link text. And this was similar to that along those lines. It's still being violated today because people are still saying, click here or click this, do this, you know. Um, you're trying to give the search engines a little more context as to where they're going to go along with where they're going to go if you hover over a link you can actually put the title in there and also it's men's athletic shoes so usually this this type of link this will definitely give enough clues to the search engines that this is what you're looking for men's athletic shoes and if they click on it that's where they're heading so okay so let's focus on the last item, the biggest resource on the internet, images. So if you use, some people get clever, some developers, and they put a background image in a div, or, you know, I guess there are some times where it makes sense, but if you're going to be 
performing any kind of SEO organic search results, it's better to have the image and use the image tag as opposed to a div with a background image, okay? Um, another thing you wanna do, use image dimensions. Uh, you wanna define the height and the width of your images or your video or whatever, because have you ever had an image, you see a little spot that says, okay, we're loading. And then all of a sudden it goes twink, it just expands saying it was trying to figure out what the size of the image was. Defining the height and the width up front when it's rendered on the page, it gives you a box and it says, okay, instead of, I, I, you know, I think we all know, it'll just display the image. But if you don't have the height and width, it's gonna make a, a janky layout shift. It's gonna, it's gonna shift a little bit and it's gonna make things a little more difficult for the eyes to track where everything's at. So <clears throat> another thing is using modern images, image formats like WebP and AVIF. These kind of, these, these format, image formats are the new hotness um, and they can cr increase the performance of your site. So um, along with that, uh, the alt and title attributes, again, you're providing a little more information based on what this image is. Um, the alt tag is also good for accessibility, and the title is if you hover over top, it'll tell you what the image is. And then finally, you can even add a descriptive file name, making it sound, okay, this is a German Shepherd dog sitting down, .jpg. That tells the, the search engines what's the image so when you get all of these images you you want to try and serve up the best image for the viewport on a, on a device and what i mean is use device specific images so you're probably wondering what do i mean when i say device specific images okay so when we serve up multi-device images we can use one of two methods. And this means you wouldn't serve a huge desktop image down, push it down to a mobile device. You would want a custom image of that, a subset of that large image for mobile devices, okay? That's where, there, there's two options on how to do that. And these are the latest modern ways to do this. I, I when I wrote my, wrote my book last year, I just found out about these two options, which are really cool. I like it. So option one is our friend, the image tag, but it's with source set. This is in all browsers right now. So for every one image, you should have different sized images to accommodate the different devices, all right? So while this may seem a little intimidating, it makes sense once we break it down. So first, the browser looks at the screen size, the pixel density, uh, the zoom level, the screen orientation, the network speed, all of these, all of these different things factor in what's going to be displayed. Uh, so once it finds, based on the sizes, it'll find the first one to be true. So if we're looking at this on a mobile device, the first thing that will show up is the 480. It'll, it'll pick that one. So depending on what slot this is, 480, this is the first slot. This is the second one. The first slot will pick the German Shepherd 480W JPEG because that's, that's the slot for the first one, okay? If not, if it's, if it's if the width of the screen is more than uh, 600, then it uses this one. It'll use that image. So in the long run, what this is going to do, it's going to save bandwidth. It's going to make things so much easier when somebody visits your website. So the second method, option two, is a picture uh, tag with multiple sources. Like I said, again, last year. I didn't even know there was a picture tag. <laughs> so the main driver for the images for the picture tag is the, 
is the uh, media queries in each source tag. This one I think I would I would use I would use once in a while, but the image would be more. I mean, everybody knows the image tag, but this one would be digging into a lot of. Uh, I, I guess either one it would be a, a, a horse apiece which one you use, but if the viewport. The max width viewport is 799 or smaller. It'll use the 480 JPEG. Okay, if not uh, 800, it'll use the 800 JPEG. And <clears throat> if no conditions are met, if it, the source media, either source media or whatever list of sources you have, if none of those are met, you have to have an image uh, as a fallback. There must be an image tag at the very bottom. So it's almost like an order of operation. It starts from the top, works down, and then if it can't find it, it uses the image. So, so how is this relevant to SEO? All right, these two techniques are meant to deliver optimized images to users. The faster the page is delivered to them, the more search engines reward for performance, which leads us into our final SEO topic. After I get through all that, there we go. Okay, devs. Two down, one to go. Let's look at tackling one of the most critical and hardest things in 2024, technical SEO. So technical SEO is broken down into the following categories, general, augment, and performance, okay? Um, with general web maintenance, since this is a .NET uh, C-sharp users group, um, We'll, we'll be digging into a little more of C sharp here. So I said this I said this to Sam about two thirds is SEO and then the other third is SEO with .NET. So with general web maintenance and house cleaning, it's always good to examine the site and just to make sure you don't have anything broken on the website. So for the .NET, .NETers out there, this includes that ominous yellow screen of death. Um, code any, errors that you think might happen and send them, redirect them to an error page, please. <laughs> um, again, back in the day, I did not have any error pages and there's the connection string right with the yellow screen of death. You know, it, it wasn't, this was early in my career. So uh, along with the yellow screens of death, broken links are one of the most constantly annoying parts of website maintenance and make sure your 404 links at least go to a customized 404 page. Again, you don't want to have uh, broken pages anywhere. Um, I, and as a little side note, did you know that you can search through Google for error pages? I will just leave that there. Uh, if users are visiting old links on a site, use 301 redirects wisely. Uh, again, I said earlier that if you change the if you change the title to something else, uh, it it could it could drop your traffic by ten to fifteen percent around there because Google's already indexed that, and it could it could be there could be hundreds of links pointing to it. Now it could be considered you know something you it'll probably get a 404 or you know you need to redirect it properly or create the brand new page pointing to it so uh just be careful with your 301s and you know use them use them wisely so <clears throat> i've experienced a number of times when multiple pages contain the same title uh, you want to try and avoid duplicate titles as much as possible because that's going to confuse the search engines. And that's, I think, that was the reason that the canonical tag was created. The canonical is to say, this is the master page. This is the original. This is the unique one where all of the other ones would be something a little different or a variation of that main one. So uh, also, and finally, Minimize the number of requests made on a page. Uh, there have been, a web page can have way too many requests going out to uh, 
scripts, styles, images. Uh, one page I've seen in the wild, as a matter of fact, last week, had 34 requests to JavaScript files. That takes a lot of time to pull that back, you know, build, compile. It, it, it's, it, it takes some time and it's not a good user experience. So tools like Screaming Frog and uh, Google Search Console are great for catching broken links and duplicate titles. So uh, I didn't stop for questions after the technical. Any questions so far? Everything kind of good? Yeah, I don't see any in chat, so I think we're good. All right, cool. Moving on. Next, we're going to augment the site. And these are these are optional tag uh, tasks to improve visibility. So um, while these techniques aren't considered mandatory, uh, again, they augment. They give search engines additional context when matching what users are looking for. So again, the more data you give to search engines, the more visibility you will receive. So the <clears throat> excuse me. When a when a spider visits your website, a, a and what I mean by spider is these search engines have these processes that go out and they crawl websites. Okay, spiders. That's what they're called. When it starts on with a home page, it parses the HTML, crawls the site by links. But what if you don't want an entire your entire site indexed? Okay, the robots text file or tag helps with this. And it tells the spiders what to index and what not to index in your website, because you don't want you don't want to advertise your login page uh, to to everybody unless you want to. Um, it's it's mostly for like for example, I created my own content management system, and I have a slash uh, folder that I don't want everybody to know about because it's um it's the you know it's the secret secret back door entrance so um and i so there's two ways to tell spiders what to index and one of them is a bulk method and this is a robots text file that's in your root and this root uh it's just a regular text file and it just says i want to disallow this areas admin and downloads Everything else on the website, you can index and put in the search engine. It doesn't matter. Just follow from the main page and search for everything. The second way to do this is by putting this inside the uh, home page or not the home page, any page on your website, you can put this in your heading, in your head tag, meta robots, and you can say index and follow all the links inside of this page. You could you could say don't index this and no follow. Don't follow any of the links and don't index this page. Hopefully they will adhere to those you know those requests. So next sitemaps. All right. Sitemaps are another way to describe your site to search engines. Uh, they give search engines a roadmap of what to crawl and what to index. The different, uh, the default uh, is sitemap.xml in the root. That's that's the default location. That's where it's placed. But the difference between, whoops, the difference between the robots text file and the sitemap XML is the robots text file uh, tells search engines which pages to avoid, and the sitemap XML tells which pages to crawl. So all of the pages on your website should be in that sitemap that you want indexed. Okay, and we'll talk about how to how to submit those. Um, the sitemap, like I said, the sitemap is usually located in the root, but it can be located somewhere else by using the link tag. Uh, this would be in this one would be in your main page. So your your home page, you can have. You can say my sitemap is located at sitemap slash XML, uh, sitemap XML. So, uh, and then the the sitemap XML contains the URL, priority, change frequency, 
and the last modified. So each one of these little properties will tell the engine uh, when it was changed, when it was last modified, you know, what is the priority of it. And today I just learned that based on some sitemap documentation, I'm not going to say any names, <coughs> Google, um, the, the priority and change frequency are ignored. The only thing that matters now is the URL and last mod, last modified. I mean, I would include priority and change frequency just in case, but they're ignored. You don't need to put anything in there. So now we can't ignore the social networks. I mean, we could, but um, with epic content that you write, we absolutely want readers to share this epic moment by sharing epic content with their epic friends. Sorry, I got a little carried away. Why not help some of the publishing channels by adding open graph tags? into your content, okay? As soon as you place a URL into a scheduling service, like let's say buffer.com, you actually want to take a URL and you know share your content across three networks. Buffer.com has a scheduling service. So you, take, you actually take that URL and you plug it in there and what it'll do, go out, look at that web page at that URL, and pull out, it'll extract these tags and then modify it for each of the three networks, whatever network you want to send it to. Right now, I have mine going to Twitter or X or whatever flavor it is this week, um, LinkedIn and Mastodon. Yeah, Mastodon. So it formats these open graph tags for you and, and gives you a very nice post that you can schedule for a certain time of day or in the week. Um, to start using these open graphs, you can probably identify, you can identify social networks by typing into a search engine, Twitter space open space graph. And it'll give you uh, almost like a developer's view of here's the tags that you put in your content for open graph for any site to use open graph tags. And if you can't find any of those tags, you can use ogp.me as a fallback. That is the, it's almost like the generic version of it. Whoops. So what do these tags look like, which you just saw? This is an example, open graph example that you put in the head of your HTML, of your content. And this was a this was a post of my book being released. Yeah, it took a year and a half to write. Uh, but the, the as, as you can see, there's Twitter colon URL at the bottom. That's the, the URL. You got the, the the title, the description. What it'll do is just extract that out and make a nice a nice post for you, and then. This is the generic version of that. I'm pretty sure some people, if they looked at the source, you'd see OG colon. You've probably seen that somewhere. Most of the blog platforms have this automatically included when you create a blog post or something along those lines. You can, it would be a plugin for WordPress, I think, that you can say, create open graph, uh, a Twitter open graph tags, and it'll just automatically put these in. So, Finally, we come to the performance part of SEO. We're almost done. Hang in there. Hang in there. So why worry about performance? Uh, why does it matter? Number one, it's, it's a better user experience in the long run. People like fast websites. I can't wait to use that slow site, said no one. Um, there's there's multiple, perf multiple stories about how slow performance uh, causes a loss of money. So I'm pretty sure everybody's heard about Amazon. For every one second that Amazon uh, is too slow, they've calculated they would lose one billion for every second. I, I just can't even fathom that. One billion for every second. So another case is autoanything.com. 
they increased, they experienced a 12 to 13% increase in sales after cutting their page load time in half, in half. So performance does equal money. So it, it, it matters so much that it's considered one of the top ranking factors for most, most search engines. So much so that Google created uh, web, the Web Vital Metrics, which me measures performance based on three concepts. Okay. The three metrics used is LCP, which is largest contentful paint. This, is, uh, this takes the largest resource that is loading on a particular page and times it. It, it. it calculates the duration, how long it's going to take. So that's why when a page completely loads, it should be 2.5 seconds as the threshold. OK, um, it could be a carousel, it could be a background image, it could be a video, whatever the resource, it's calculated into the page load. And that should be addressed immediately, why it takes so long. Um, so the next, the next metric is interaction the next paint. So this measures the interactivity, and it should be 200 milliseconds or less. So the, the, this, is, this occurs when you have impatient users, OK? We all have impatient users. It's the moment when you click something, and the screen it doesn't react fast enough. So it's the moment the screen looks ready, but it really isn't. It may be too busy loading a JavaScript framework, waiting for the rest of the page to render, or even just bad programming where uh, it's calculating something before any response is evident, before you even see anything happen. Okay. Um, and then finally, CLS, the cumulative layout shift. Cumulative layout shift, uh, this, this is how well the visual stability is on that page. And what I mean by visual stability is, uh, remember how I add, remember how I mentioned to add uh, widths and height to your images? Um, ever have that moment where you think everything loaded properly and then a heading a applies a web font and it shifts the layout really quick? Uh, that's CLS. I had one personal experience where uh, a dialogue box. I was making a payment to a credit card company. I'm not saying who, but making a, a, a payment and a dialogue box was up and it said, I typed in the, the numbers, hit OK, nothing happened. Hit OK again, nothing happened. Finally, the dialogue went away. Right where I clicked with the button, guess what button was right underneath it? It was the submit. I submitted double payments. <laughs> to the credit card company. So yeah, that was fun trying to get that taken care of. Um, yeah, so those metrics are used a, a lot through Google. And that's, that's, their, that's how their metrics determine whether a page is, is fast enough. So this is even in I just read that they actually pushed out a new update to Chrome. If you look, if you hit F12 and go to performance tab, they have some new features in there, which are, I, I haven't seen them yet, but I, I think I have the blog post on my post on my site. Um, pretty, it's pretty interesting that you can get that performance in the browser right away and including those metrics. So. Uh, let's dig into some more specifics with .NET. How can we improve website performance for SEO? And I just hit the button, so that just released the, that got rid of the surprise. Okay, so caching. I'm sure everyone knows what caching is. Like they say, the best database call is no call at all. So there's two kinds of caching that I like to do. One is data, where you read the data from the database, you store it in a caching mechanism, whether it's iMemory cache or it's Redis or whatever whatever mechanism you want you want to use, and then you just call that when it's needed, based on a unique key uh, from inputs, and it's that's pretty pretty easy. 
Um, if it's a read-only website, this is probably the easiest way to do this. Um, my whole website, besides sending an email to me, is all read-only. So, yeah, I've put some high caching durations on my site. Um, the other one, if you've been doing ASP.NET MVC, page caching, uh, you know what the output cache looks like, and it'll just cache that page if it detects it. So well, I, while you can do both, I prefer to do the, the data caching as much as possible. It just makes, I don't know, it, it, for me, it makes things a little easier for caching the data. So, so as a standard, if you've been in web development for a while, you know most web development efforts should have a process to bundle minify and or optimize a website's assets whether that's images, videos, whatever. But bundling is the process of combining a number of files into one file. And minifying is the process of removing spaces to shrink the size. And that can include images. You can use image optim, or uh, I use tinypng for my CMS. Tinypng.com even has a web API. So those are those are nice. You actually post to tiny PNG and you say these are the this is how I want to compress it and it returns it back uh, compressed. So um, if you type in optimize images into your favorite search engine, you'll find a slew of image optimizers. There's a lot of them out there. And you can even use Visual Studio uh, extension by Mads Christensen uh, called Image Optimizer. You can actually include that. And I think VS, I think VS Code has an image optimizer as well. So again, CSS and JavaScript, you can bundle, you can do this either through Visual Studio add-ons, or you could use a task runner with a gulp script, which uh, I think I have that on my website. Um, and you can even minify HTML. Uh, you can create an HTML uh, middleware component in ASP.NET Core. Uh, I think I wrote about this in the book, where you can actually get rid of all the white space. And it, it's, it's a jumbled mess. The browser doesn't care. And in some cases, this even minimizes the load time by 20, 20 to 40%. So you'll get a, sh a small HTML shipped back to the browser relatively quick. Okay. To finish off this section, here are some quick server-side .NET wins to boost performance. Now, let me know if anybody's heard of any of these, because some of these have been, I, I like how simple some of these are. All right. One quick tip with Entity Framework, I don't know, is, is to uh, turn off uh, your change state management since it's included by default, all right? To turn off your entity framework calls, simply add as no tracking, and this will reduce the uh, entity framework overhead for the uh, state management. It makes, it's basically like you're making a SQL call with no changes made. It just does a plain SQL, pulls it back, done. And it just displays the data. If you're, if you're going to be doing any kind of retrieving, this is what I would recommend. But if you're going to do uh, create, update, delete, I would take as no tracking off because that's going to require, you know, what changes were made to your entities so it can optimize the SQL statement to send back to the to SQL server or whatever database you're using. So if you use Entity Framework heavily, you can boost your performance by adding four letters, P-O-O-L. If you put in add DB context pool, what this is going to do every time when an entity framework is done with the DB context, it resets the state and stores it in an internal pool. Okay. The next time you need a new instance, it just pulls that uh, a pooled instance is returned instead of creating a brand new one. So it's recycling to the max with DB context. So the, the add DB context pool 
will give you a huge performance gains if you just add those four letters. So um, I feel everyone has beat this drum at one time or another, but use asynchronous calls, async await when calling databases or reading files. Excuse me, this scales your application immensely when the time comes to scale it up. Um, and then finally, when using <coughs> um, in ASP.NET Core, when you use static files, there is a way that you can say, uh, cache all of your static content like images, style sheets, scripts. Um, you can pass in a static file options and add certain caching options for, let's say, you want all of www root cached. You can specify that you want that entire directory structure set up to cache. So that would greatly improve uh, the site, secondary site uh, visits on the site. So um, managing, okay, that was the last .NET, but let's get into some of the tools. And then this is, we're in the home stretch here. So managing all this seems overwhelming, not knowing what's changed and what hasn't changed. It's hard to, to keep track of all the links. So it doesn't matter what size website you have. It's a lot to manage when you have you know entire websites with multiple pages and trying to figure out what's working and what doesn't work. But site tools, these are the most helpful tools that I've used throughout the years, uh, like Google Analytics, Google Search Console. Those two go hand in hand and they work fantastic. Um, Bing Webmaster Tools, I visit once, maybe once a month. Um, Screaming Frog is another, uh, it is a, is it a UK based? I think it's UK based. Uh, it's a fat client that you download. I think it's written in Java, but it is becoming one heck of a utility where it digs so deep into your website, it'll tell you if you have multiple H1 tags, it'll look at the tags and just come up with some really great uh, statistics. It's free up to 500 pages. It'll crawl your entire website, but only up to 500 pages. If you want more, there's a premium version that you can you can use. Um, for keyword research, I would absolutely recommend Google Keyword Planner, and that is located in Google's AdWords. It's, it's not buried, but um, it'll say, Please enter your credit card number and I, I while well, I have, I haven't used anything on it where I've created ads. So, so long as you can do keyword planning and, and examine some of the keywords, you'll be able to pull the data out and look at keyword research. Uh, again, keyword research, SEMrush, Ahrefs, and keywordseverywhere.com. That is a Google Chrome extension. I think it's also for Firefox. But once you add this extension to your browser, when you do search results, it'll come up and say, this is a top 100 keyword, or this is a website that has um, uh, domain authority, or it'll have all of these little, uh, little metrics underneath each uh, each result entry. So it's it's definitely a good one to hang on to as well. Uh, reporting, I have a couple clients where I use Google's Looker Studio. I don't know if you've seen that before, but it's almost like a reporting tool for Google Analytics, uh, basically Google's products. So you can have... Um, Google Analytics reports combined with Google Search Console to find out what the top keywords that everybody's coming to your website. And you can format it and make it look pretty through Google's Looker Studio. Okay. Um, okay, when it comes to performance, <clears throat> uh, again, I said Chrome DevTools. That's probably, that's coming right from the source. So these people know performance. I, I would look at using Chrome DevTools 
uh, for most of your client side delivery. Um, also, uh, pagespeedweb.dev and gtmetrics.com, those are really good tools for site auditing. So if you want to give your website a once over and you want to look it over and see how well the performance is on the main page, you would just enter in the main page. It won't crawl the entire website. It'll go page by page. It'll go whatever page you enter in the URL and give you statistics on it. What's good about it, what's bad about it, but I'm sure you could apply those to subsequent pages. So, uh, some SEO resources I use. For some of the news, searchengineland.com and searchenginejournal.com. These two are probably the ones I have been using for a long time, a long time. I've been a lurker. I haven't subscribed or anything, but you don't need to. They keep producing quality content as to what the search engines are doing. And it's a daily thing. Yeah, again, you don't know what the search engine algorithms are doing, but that's, that's the other thing. We talked about at the very beginning, this was one of the challenges. How do you know when the Google algorithm is changing? You know, what's, what's going on there? And there is a, uh, there is a tool called Penguin Tool. And I think where this came from was Google had Panda updates. That's what they were naming them. And Penguin updates. So I have a feeling they combined the two and created this Penguin Tool. So um, they actually connect through Google Analytics and pulls one of your properties over and displays it on the screen and then says, here's when the Google update happened. Here's another Google update that happened. And it's trying to help you as much as, as much as they can to say, if your traffic went down in one of these, after one of these deploys, it'll, it'll, it'll show, you know, what happened. So it's definitely a good tool to hang on to. And then also under searchenginejournal.com, they have uh, Google algorithm updates. Very, very well, very well, uh, very well written. And the SE, SE roundtable.com. So, so from a, a developer's perspective, I have given you a full stack approach affecting us SEO from client side all the way back to C-sharp performance. And this should give you insight into everything involved with building a website for the public. These techniques, this is, this is, this is taken eh, probably 20 years for me to write <laughs> to make this presentation. <laughs> If you know what I mean, it, it's I've been doing this for a long time, and it's something that I haven't I haven't realized that I've been doing until I was asked by Sam to write this to to create a presentation for this. It's it's a lot to take in, but this is just a public website. Of course, this doesn't even include you managing the real application that you built behind the login screen. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. I thought you did a fantastic job, quite honestly. Uh, a lot of useful resources, a lot of great tips. Um, I was taking notes as we were going, and then I got to the point where I'm like, I'm just going to have to review this again. <laughs> uh, I didn't quite capture everything, but uh, that was excellent. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted want to, to put as much info on each slide that people could take something away with it and have some value and immediately implement it. That's my, yeah, that was my thinking. So. Right. And there were a lot of uh, key takeaways and it wasn't very verbose per slide um, and it shouldn't be. Uh, so I thought you did a great job with that. Thank you. Um, Thank you very but, much. Uh, wanted I wanted to agree. ask, are there... sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I agree. It, this was superb. One of the best sessions I've seen. Thank you. Thank you I so much. I completely agree. Um, any questions or comments for Jonathan? It's certainly given me a lot to think about. Um, I just got an HTML task. I'm a back ender and I just got an HTML task. I'm like, eek, it's been a long time. <laughs> 
So this this is really, really good timing and very insightful. Thank good. you. Good. Then I have to I said this to Sam. I, I said this is probably only my throughout my entire career, this is only my second presentation I've done ever. You did great. You did a wonderful job. Yeah, it was really Thank well you. put together. Thank you very much. Um, if there's no questions, I have one for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so you talked about performance and uh, and the, the, the tags used and so forth. Do you find that there's a difference if I was to use WordPress uh, versus building a site in, in .NET? And let's just say it's going to be a very, um, like it's a, a website um, that's basically uh, about me, uh, my interests, my career, resume perhaps. Um, would it, so taking that type of content, would it be better to do it in WordPress or would it be better to do it in uh, .NET from scratch? So I, I also have a philosophy where since I've been doing this for so long, I, I, there's, this is going to be the long answer, Sam. So <laughs> um, Those are the best. Back, back when I was doing this in 95, 96, I said to myself, you know, it would be really cool if I could create a classic ASP website and use access to make it you know, data access driven, you know, data driven. Wouldn't this be really cool? And I started building something. Then I kept going and going and I, I worked with it in uh, .NET Core, or not, not, not .NET Core, uh, web forms. I kept building the content management system, kept building it, and then I used MVC. Now I'm converting it right now to Core. It's like my philosophy is always have a, I'll always pretend to be a Frankenstein. So always have your one little project that you're using and experimenting on with new techniques, and new technologies. For me, it was just, I want to write it in .NET. I don't want to use anything else. It, it's, I want to create it this way. And I've been doing it ever since just to keep up with the .NET, uh, the .NET versions that are coming out. And it's, God, it's exhausting. <laughs> but nowadays, uh, some people like WordPress. WordPress is, if you want to create a blog, by all means, uh, WordPress has built it into a, almost like a science where they have these tags, they have the speed, they are putting all of this behind it, and it's all packaged up into this one little wrapper. And you say, I want to make a website, poof. There's your website, you know, and there's your blog. If if you're looking for something quick, um, as in to to push out really fast, I would recommend one of you know. There's Orchard, um, WordPress, uh, Gatsby, Jekyll. I mean, there's there's a lot of them. The .NET was mostly I wanted to see how I could how performant I could get my Frankenstein's monster. So this was kind of my my little experiment. Always have a project where you can experiment and greatly, greatly further your learning is what I'm getting at. So I guess you could use WordPress, but creating a blog, I don't think would be too bad. It wouldn't be too hard to do. So it's, and again, this has been 20, 25 years of me building this stuff in and going, oh, open graph tags. I think I'll put that into my website. You know, it's that kind of, that kind of uh, experimenting. And then funny enough, um, actually I could probably share, let me see if I can bring up a page here. Here you go. Uh, we wanna share again. Sure. Share my screen. Do, 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 do. There we go. So one of the tools that I used is GT metrics. And I mentioned this as one of the tools. So if I type in, I can't even spell my name. There we go. So what it does, it'll go grab that one page and it's creating a test server location. It's, it's running the page in Vancouver, Canada using Chrome. 
So what it's going to do, it's going to fetch the site. I hope. I think it's still up and running. <laughs> there we go. And then also Lighthouse is another um, Google extension that you can use for uh, testing your site. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, but this is this is what it does. Web Vitals. I was talking about mm -hmm. LCP, largest contentful paint, 606 milliseconds. Total blocking time, 43. I, I cut down the total blocking time is limiting the amount of scripts and the amount of styles that you create. So the least number of requests, there are some times where some of the scripts could block and it, you'll have to wait until that script loads for anything to render. Uh, no cumulative layout shift, structures 91% and log in to see the rest, but yeah. This is uh, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, it, it went up since the last time, so they must have added enhancements. So, very There's, cool. But generally speaking, uh, and let's just go outside the realm of uh, a website about me. Uh, let's just make it, let's just say any website. Okay. Is it better to build it in WordPress or is it better to build it in, um, in .NET? And this is specifically for search engine optimization, which would be a better route to go. Again, it, it just, I, I think going .NET would definitely get you into the details of what you need to do. Most of the WordPress stuff, if, if it was for SEO stuff, um, WordPress already has all of that built into it. Um, are you talking about just, you know, creating, creating a blog geared towards SEO or implementing SEO into a particular platform? I guess to rephrase my question, yeah. which framework performs better for uh, SEO, WordPress or, or .NET framework? Or really depends on how the site is built. It depends on how the site is built. Okay. Definitely. Um, like I said, uh, there's a majority of plugins. There's, there's so many plugins for WordPress that it just makes it so easy. Mm -hmm. And it, as a as a as a side story, somebody said to me at one point, "I wrote, I built a website over the weekend." Oh, really? What did you use? WordPress? Oh, okay. And all they did was like click and drag things over, mm -hmm. and they said, "I'm a developer." And I'm like, "Uh, okay." <laughs> so yeah, it 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 could go. It I think, like I said, it's taken 20 years to build my blog and add all the SEO stuff in just to keep experimenting with it. WordPress probably already has it in it, but mm -hmm. the more I keep looking at .NET, it is, it is doing fantastic in the performance department. It's, it's really very fast. It's becoming as fast as, if not faster. So with .NET Core. So. Of course, another key aspect is the, the hosting provider as well. Yes, that that is also a key uh, factor yeah. with SEO because they could have, have it some uh, somebody uh, could have it running on their 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 fat 386 underneath the desk. You know, you, you don't know. <laughs> so very true. OK, thank you Excellent. so much, everyone. Uh, thank you. This was a uh, I just wanted to uh, throw it out there. Any um, last opportunity for questions or comments uh, before we go through some wrap-up slides? And if not, I have a couple things that I'd like to go through. So if I may, I'd like to uh, share my screen. And you'll notice that in the chat window, we have a variety of links. And uh, one of them is the link to the YouTube channel. If you would please subscribe to that to get upload notifications whenever this video is uploaded. Uh, in addition, tech events, you can be found on my blog, samnasser.blogspot.com. And also, uh, if you would please subscribe to this. Last but not least is the feedback eval form. And the link for that is also posted in the chat window. Uh, with regards to tech events, one of the things that I wanted to share is a SQL Saturday event that's coming up on October 12th. 
And uh, for those of you not familiar with SQL Saturday, as the name suggests, it is uh, a Saturday event, specifically October 12th in Pittsburgh. And uh, these are hosted all around the world at, on various Saturdays. So if you go to SQLSaturday.com, and let me just browse to that real quick. If you go to SQLSaturday.com, you'll see that there are a variety of events worldwide in various cities. Some are virtual, some are in person, um, and some are hybrids. But more specifically, the one that's happening in, um, in, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, it's basically an all-day event of SQL Server or database-related topics. Uh, the cost for that is minimal. It's free of charge if you want to bring your own lunch or $15 for the lunch being provided. The nice thing about it, you have all day in various topics, and uh, someone that we know here is going to be presenting on data cleansing for machine learning. That's yours truly. But you have speakers and authors uh, from all different parts of the country that are coming to present on these various topics. So for a minimal cost, only a two-hour drive from Cleveland, uh, I strongly encourage you to attend this. Again, you can go to SQLSaturday.com and select the Pittsburgh event on October 12th, and then you can register from there. If you're in the job market, I encourage you to check out devitjobs.com. This is a unique website that allows you to filter on the various technologies that you want to work in, as well as the location, and select whether either in-person or remote. Uh, so if you're in the market, feel free to check out devitjobs.com. Lastly, if you have any questions regarding tonight's presentation, or you have suggestions about future topics, or you need to reach me for any reason, I can be contacted at snasser at nistechnologies.com. You can also find all my socials on Linktree. And last but not least, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, I invite you to do so. And so with that, thanks again to Jonathan, and thank you all for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month. Good night, everyone.